Hello and welcome to The Kim Iverson Show. Thank you all for being here. Tonight, we're sitting down with Dennis Kucinich. De Dennis served 16 years in the House representing Ohio and has long been known as the voice against the Iraq War. But Dennis has also been championing causes that were long considered fringe. Yet today, they're rising in popularity, especially amongst populist ideas like reigning in on the surveillance state, bringing home troops, and rethinking trade agreements. He's also long supported ideas that are popular amongst progressives, such as universal health care and free education. Dennis, thank you so much for joining the show. It's really great to sit down with you. Thanks, Kim. Uh, thanks for the invitation. And also, I I, uh, you know, I do these shows, but this is really important to have the discussion we're going to have going forward because of what's happening in our uh, world and in our nation at the moment. So thank you. Yeah, uh, you know, you have been long known as one of the few voices against war. Um, and I, I kind of want to start with that, with the Democratic Party and how it just seems that for a long time there were voices amongst the left that were more against war. But now, interestingly, we're seeing these voices coming from the right. You know, we're seeing more Republicans voting against the increased military budgets or um, increasing funding to Ukraine or, or actually the ones calling for peace are coming more from the Republican side of the aisle. Why do you think that is? Well, what has happened? Uh, there's a number of different dynamics here. Uh, one of which, you're right, I mean, there's been a shift among the Democratic Party of people who seem to uh, favor conflict, and that's remarkable. Uh, back in uh, 20, uh, 2002, I organized 126 Democrats to vote against the Iraq War Resolution and laid out chapter and verse why we didn't have to go to war against Iraq. 126 Democrats, that was, you know, more than half of the Democratic caucus, and people were really involved uh, to, to oppose uh, the United States' involvement in the Iraq War. Uh, today, uh, you know, the latest is that uh, a group of congressmen identified more with the progressives, uh, held back a letter that was kind of weak, asking uh, for a reconsideration of uh, of the war in, in Ukraine, and uh, they did so under enormous pressure. Uh, what's happening is the Democratic Party is closing ranks behind the Biden administration's foreign policy, and that means congressional Democrats, that means members of the House and the Senate. And there's some idea that this unanimity will uh, lead to an electoral uh, success in 2024. I would argue the opposite. I would argue that as it is revealed, that our efforts uh, in, in Ukraine have not only demolished that country and used its people as pawns and sacrificed their sons and daughters to some wild idea that uh, uh, the United States can take down Russia and conquer the rest of the world. Um, we, we, we find ourselves in a situation where the kind of group cohesion, which does exist within the Democratic Party, has become toxic, that there's no questioning what's happening. Uh, and, and if there is, it's, it, it's very few people. So I, I think this is more than problematic, because uh, if you don't have a robust debate over matters relating to war and peace within both political parties, you put the nation at peril. Yeah, and this is something that has really, I think, confused many of us who are watching on the sidelines. I've never been in in politics like you've been, so you have an inside knowledge of how it all works. And so many of us are very confused. I mean, we've seen progressives um, from the left, such as AOC and Ilan Omar, and you know, now they're being confronted by anti-war activists, mostly from the LaRouche um, you know, organization that are that are confronting them at these events and saying, "Why are you? Why are you continually putting it, uh, pushing these policies, or supporting, or at least not standing against them?" To the point where we're, you know, we're we're butting up against World War III, and you guys aren't doing anything about this. You know, it's amazing because all of these politicians were voted into office with the idea that they were going to stand up to the establishment, that they were finally going to go in there and, because, you know, we've seen the Democratic Party shift over the years, especially as they've decided to take corporate money. That really changed the dynamic, and it really made it to where we don't have two parties. We have one uniparty that just pretends 
uh, that there are two different parties and they're really fighting about cultural issues, but they seem to be lockstep in line with one another when it comes to some of the, the biggest decisions that face our country, especially like war. Um, so what is it, what happens? You know, why is it that these people got into office, they were voted in with a certain idea, the people back them for that, and then they get there and they suddenly seem to just fall in line with the establishment. What kind of pressure is on them? Is it just, I, you know, what is it from your perspective that causes this well, shift? You know, there is a pressure towards consensus. There's no question about it. I mean, if you run as a Democrat or Republican, you, uh, upon election, join either the Democratic caucus or the Republican conference. And there, there, there are there group pressures for homogenization? Absolutely. And for people who raise questions, particularly if you're new, uh, you know, you suddenly are approached by le by leadership, which will say, well, you, you don't really understand this. And, you know, they'll prey upon people's lack of experience. And it's particularly easy with foreign policy. So um, and then in addition to that, you have the major defense contractors who contribute uh, liberally to both political parties and to certain candidates. Uh, that further complicates it. You have people who are looking for help for their districts and they feel that if they buck the establishment, they'll get shut out. That's a factor. Uh, you know, what comes in often last is their constituents. And uh, when I, I remember in 2006, when uh, the Iraq war was a hot issue and in the primaries, the Democrats back candidates, even knowing that that the people wanted the, an end to the war, the Democratic Party backed congressional candidates who were basically for the war. And, and people in November voted Democrats in, not knowing that they elected people that wanted to keep the war going. And so what happened when the Democrats took control of Congress in 2006? They decided to keep the war going. <laughs> you know, people wonder, how could this happen? I voted Democratic. It's supposed to change. Well, the the, the, what people often do not understand is that once you get inside that beltway and inside the Capitol complex, it's like a magic box. One thing goes in, but what comes out doesn't remotely resemble the will of the people. And uh, the consequences are severe for not only America, but for the world right at this moment. Yeah, and I, I, it, it's just, it is strange. And I wonder where the pressure really does come from you know, why do they come out different than, than the way they go in? Is, is, it, is it the money, you know, are they threatened with, you're not going to get funding for your campaign? Are they threatened with, you won't get any committee assignments? Are they just worried they're not going to be invited to parties? <laughs> you know, and that's know. what, my, you know, that you was know, a lot I, of my experience. Think, yeah, go ahead. I don't think so. I, I think, I mean, I don't think it has to do about not getting invited to parties. And I don't know how much it has to do with, uh, campaign contributions. But I can tell you this, when the Democrats are the party in power in the White House, there's tremendous pressure on House Democrats and Senate Democrats to hew to the White House's line. So this has much more to do with who's holding the presidency. And since you have a presidency, that is marked by a very hawkish approach towards international relations. You have uh, Democrats in the House who fall in line, and most of the Democrats in the Senate will fall in line. There are some leaders who believe that it's the job of, of members of Congress to support the president of their party. And that, that's nothing new. Uh, where it becomes um, adverse to the interests of the American people is when the president of a political party happens to be on a path for war, where where he and you know in the future she wants wants war, and the people around that president want war, and this is where we're at right now. But it doesn't really seem like Joe Biden actually wants war. It feels like it's people around him. I mean, it, when he he actually seems a little bit more measured even though he's not very measured. And as we've le learned with like Nord Stream being blown up uh, from Seymour Hersh's reporting and the United States being behind that, that was a very bad decision to do. I mean, and we, I do want to talk about that with you, but 
in many ways, it has felt like Joe Biden's been a little bit more measured than, let's say, the people around him would like him to be, namely Antony Blinken, I think, would like to go further into these aggressions than Joe Biden wants to. But yet Joe Biden himself almost seems to fall in line with the will of the people around him. Why do you think that is? Kim, an administration is an administration is an administration. <laughs> this is it's not just about one person. It's about a group of people. And the decisions that are made are made by a group. Uh, they're made by the National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, uh, by the Secretary of State, uh, Blinken, uh, by uh, assistants in the State Department, such as Victoria Nuland. Um, they're in on the decision making, they have been particularly with respect to Ukraine. And while uh, let's not get moist eyed about the president, because he has, throughout his career, taken a rather hawkish approach on uh, foreign policy. Uh, you know, he, he and I have uh, some agreement on domestic policy, but on inter, you know international and foreign policy, we couldn't be further apart. So he takes, you know, Terry Truman said the buck stops here. So the buck has to stop with the president. But you're also correct. There are people around him who may feel more strongly about these things for ideological reasons that, again, are adverse to the interests of the American people. And when it gets to the point of where that small group of people are making decisions that effectively override the Constitution of the United States and the um, Article I role of the Congress of the United States, that's where you get into activity that is against the law and uh, that puts America and our, our nation, our people, in jeopardy. And that is where we are now. Yeah, uh, definitely. And really glad you bring this up. Um, but just to recap that, you're saying that you believe that the bully pulpit is actually more in control of the, the, the narrative of the party. So if we had an anti-war president on the Democratic side of the aisle, then Democrats, you believe, would fall in line with that. So by that is very- large, Good point. It's a very good point. I think by and large, that's true. Now, I want to make okay. this clear. I don't think that Joe Biden is per se a warmonger. I don't think he is. I, I think that he uh, uh, would rather not send our sons and daughters into conflict uh, and put their lives on the line. I don't think he wants to do that, but he's getting pulled in that direction for sure. Yeah. And, uh, and he is giving a green light to certain things that could result uh, in, in jeopardizing the lives of American men and women who cur you know, currently serve and could result in drafting hundreds of thousands of Americans into the uh, service of the country for a mission that is wrong. Yeah, so he's not a warmonger, but he's also not anti-war. And he's certainly bring bringing us to the brink of World War III. And I want to get into that now. You know, I'm curious, are we even living in a democracy at all? Because as you mentioned, you know, they're making decisions that are not, they're not bringing in the American people into these decisions. The recent reporting from Seymour Hersh is that the United States apparatus, which the def whoever made those decisions, a group of people got together and they decided it would be a good idea to blow up the pipeline that went from Russia to Germany uh, and, and did it with the help of Norway. That is an act of war. I don't know how, however else you want to, that, that's an act of war, not only against the nation of Russia, but also against Germany. I'm surprised Germany's not right now uh, freaking out and, and pointing the finger at the United States and saying, how dare you? Uh, Greta Thunberg style, it'd be nice to see them do that. You know, like, how dare you? How dare you do this to us? Because this was a massive act of war, but yet, where were the, why, why were the American people not brought in on this decision? If Russia confirms this reporting, because what I would imagine is happening behind the scenes right now is that Russia and Germany are both scrambling to confirm this. And they're going to all of the sources and they're trying to put the puzzle pieces together and they're saying, is this true? And if they confirm that it is, uh, you know, I don't know what Germany is going to do about it. But Russia, on the other hand, could absolutely view this as an act of war and say, that's it. We're going to war now. You guys have done something egregious towards us. Where were the American people 
in that decision to wage war against Russia directly? Why are we not being brought into any of these decisions? And it's not just this Ukraine conflict. It's been every conflict since World War II. We have not been able to vote on any of these conflicts. We've never really declared war. And yet we're endlessly in war. So are we really even in a democracy or what's going on? We're being bamboozled. Um, well, as someone who challenged every U.S. Uh, intervention as a member of Con that took place while I was in Congress from 1997 to 2013, I, I do appreciate that our nation has been led um, uh, down the path, down the bloodstained path, to uh, one conflict, one war after another, with uh, based on lies, period. You can't put it any other way. Now, Seymour Hirsch, uh, as some people know, won a Pulitzer Prize for his reporting on the My Lai Massacre back during the time of the Vietnam War. Uh, at the time that he wrote that story, there were many people who said, this can't be possible, this never happened. But as the story held up, uh, Americans began to understand uh, that we were visiting upon a people, a, a, a horror which uh, was inexplicable and indefensible. Uh, and uh, Seymour Hersh's reporting brought that forward. Now, this latest report by Seymour Hersh has helped to um, almost annotate the narrative that many had already believed, and that is that the U.S. was involved in blowing up the pipeline. Now, people like Secretary, former Secretary of State Pompeo, who from the start has said it's Russia, it's Russia, it's Russia, uh, very hard to be able to make the case that Russia would want to cost itself a billion dollars or more a day uh, in, in destroying a pipeline that would be a source of ongoing income for them. Um, so what Hirsch has written raises uh, several very, very urgent questions. Number one, was this a violation of Article One, Section 7 of the United States Constitution, which says that uh, the war power resides in Congress and Congress alone? And I, don't think, I don't think there's any question about it. Of course it was, uh, which means, uh, and, and there was a decided effort to go to uh, come up with a rationalization that would say, well, we don't have to go to Congress. We're blowing up a pipeline belonging to another country or other countries carrying fuel to, to Europe. And, and that's okay without consulting with Congress. And you have to look at the reasoning why this was to weaken Russia economically, and open up markets for countries, including the United States, that have opposed Russia. I mean, it's a mafia kind of move, really. It's nothing you would think would, would reflect what most people hope the United States represents, honesty and decency and integrity and a forthright approach and, and, and in defending liberty. This wasn't what it was about at all. This was a dirty deal right from the beginning, kept Congress in the dark. So there's constitutional questions here that are going to be raised. There's questions of international law. There are laws that govern the safety and protection of pipelines. There are questions relating to uh, the Geneva and the Hague conventions uh, there that have to be resolved. There's questions that deal with um, uh, putting civilian populations at risk essentially taking away a fuel supply on, on, uh, during, you know, that would be available during really cold months. Um, so you, you look at the law of the seas, the law governing pipelines, the international agreements, the Constitution of the United States, and more, and on every one of those counts, our government, the government of the United States of America, appears to have gone against U.S. law and gone against uh, international law. Now, when that happens, 
when the law is repeatedly uh, subverted, uh, that uh, could uh, inevitably be considered an act of terror. Uh, there is no license to do that. I don't care what intentions are or anything. There is no license to do that. And an administration cannot do that without the consent of Congress. And even if they had the consent of Congress, it would have been wrong. But they went around Congress. So uh, we have not heard the end of this. The implications of this are extraordinary. Russia has a, an international claim here. Germany and other countries have international claims. And we have, uh, we have reached a, a, a new epoch in American history here, where the United States, the power of the United States is being misused by government officials acting in their, in their narrow capacities on behalf of 360 million people uh, without regard to the, to the immediate short-term and long-term consequences. They could have put us into World War III with this. They could have put us there. I mean, we do not know where this is going to go as these, uh, as more and more facts come out. Well, let's face it. What Seymour Hersh did was apparently painstakingly reconstruct the entire narrative of the uh, pipeline bombing. And it is shocking, really. And, and it goes beyond being disappointing. It is shocking. It is illegal. And Mr. and Mrs. America, there must be accountability. There must be accountability. And I would start with the Secretary of State, the National Security Advisor, uh, Victoria Newland, and anybody else who was in and presenting that to the president. Or, look, maybe the president said that. Where were his advisors saying, don't do that? <laughs> They're all together. Let's do it. Let's go bomb the pipeline. Really? Without, I mean, where's the thinking? <laughs> what were they thinking that, that no one would ever find out in today's world? To, uh, to think that you can do anything, commit any kind of crime, and nobody finds out. You, that doesn't happen anymore. Somebody's always watching. And so uh, there's, it's magical thinking. And then you go to a point where we're the United States of America. We'll do anything we want. Where'd that come from? And the fact that they were able to rope Norway into it, that was a big shocker, actually. I mean, I was thinking maybe Poland, you know, it, it was obvious that some other country was in on it, but it was the question of which one, UK, Poland, uh, you know, Germany themselves potentially, but Norway, I mean, the, you know, we always think of Scandinavian countries as being, uh, you know, not, not as interested in engaging in these things. But then again, the very next day, a pipeline turns on between Norway and Europe, and and they've got the they've got the ability to make a bunch of money. And not only this, but this sh this should be this story that has come out should in anger people in California, quite frankly. But of course, it won't. I'm living in the state of California now. We are experiencing currently extremely high heat bills, extremely high heat bills, um, so high that you know when I look at my neighborhood board apps that where people are complaining about things or talking about things like lost pets or burglaries. Every post right now is, what is going on? Why is my heat bill five times higher than it was last year or even last month? I, I, I don't understand. Maybe I have a gas leak or these gas companies are price gouging us. And yet the LA Times has reported, well, the reason why the gas prices are so high right now, the, the cost of heat is so high is because uh, we had an unnaturally cold winter in the state. We needed hot, we needed more, we needed more natural gas. We didn't have it. Why didn't we have it? Well, they even report, well, because we had to sell it to Europe because we told Europe, don't worry about being cut off from Russian gas. Uh, we'll supply you what you need. And they did. And what it's cost is the American people are now paying the price in a state like California. Um, and, but, you know, of course, the average person in California is not really putting the two and two together on that. But where do we go from here? You know, how is it going to be year after year after year? So it wasn't just something that affected Europeans. It is coming home. It is affecting the United States. But people aren't quite there yet. Uh, maybe if this happens over and over and over again, then they will start to put the pieces together. But, you know, with his reporting on this, um, th this does seem it does bring up the, the question of accountability, as you brought up. Who would be held accountable? And you list off all the names and probably Joe Biden himself, since he's the guy that would have to ultimately say green light. Let's it's a go. Let's do this. 
But this also brings me to the Iraq war. You know, a time you were very, very uh, vocally very against the Iraq war, the, uh, the voice against the Iraq war. You were demonized. You were smeared. Uh, people painted you as being the, you know, the, the crazy one. And yet a lot of those people that were for the Iraq war that pushed for it have now later come out and said, well, I was wrong. Right. We hear that. Ah, OK, I shouldn't have supported. I was wrong. But where's the accountability? I mean, it just seems like the only people who pay the price are the people who stand up against it at that moment. And then after that, there just doesn't seem to be any reckoning for all of these people from from news. You know, the same newscasters are on the air right now that push for the Iraq war. And they're the same people now pushing for the war against Russia. You know, we these people are still there. They're in the media. They're in they're in the they're in the Congress. They're in the administration. I mean, they're everywhere. They're, where is the accountability for the people who make all of these bad foreign policy decisions time after time after time again? Is there ever going to be accountability? Uh, we can only hope so. And if someone believes in, in a heaven and hell, uh, there'll be accountability. But um, there's two points to your, uh, what you just said. One is the uh, shortages in California and the, where the gas going to Europe. Now keep in mind that these, these, these energy interests are making money on the shortage in California, because you know the prices are gonna go up, but they're, but they're gouging on prices in Europe where people in Europe are paying four to six times what they paid previously for, for energy. This is changing the standard of living for people in California and in Europe as well, which you know is used to having a middle class uh, type of uh, of economic structure. Uh, you know, I would predict that the long term effect of the machinations that went behind the uh, uh, Ukraine war will result in many European governments uh, going down. Uh, I think Germany's government isn't for long. And what could, you know, here, their pipeline was bombed. <laughs> the pipeline was going to give them uh, access to to energy, particularly during winter months. And it was bombed by their great ally. <laughs> I mean, how does that play in, in Germany? I, I, I will tell you, I don't think that there's any way that uh, the Schultz government is going to escape uh, the consequences of this. Think about this. If you're an American ally and something is done to injure you, if, if any of us have a friend that goes out of their way to hurt us, how long would we want them to be our friend? Not for very long. So that's one point I wanted to make about what you said. The other thing is the big picture here is that America has moved away from democracy. We're, we're into an autocracy ruled by a few people, nullifying Congress, and that moves us towards something that is profoundly undemocratic uh, and complicating it is that the media has become a, the major media has become nothing less than a spear carrier for the government, a kind of supernumerary in this uh, in this grand and grim opera, where we find uh, whatever the government says, uh, the uh, news media becomes a uh, a chorus uh, saying yes, of course. That's that's dangerous as well, and and there's a false consensus that has been built in the United States about the Ukraine war. And the one thing that's going to break that, I think, is the cost as we go from 100 million to 150 million, uh, 100 billion to 150 billion and beyond, people uh, who are worried about heating their homes or worried about the price of eggs, who are concerned about feeding their families, who are concerned about paying their uh, uh, their bills for health care and, and other things, they have to look at that and say, hey, what about taking care of things here at home? And I think we're going to see more of that. And we're also going to see 
more critical analysis in the Congress, particularly among Republicans, of what the administration has been doing with respect to this war, how everything has been moving towards an escalation, putting us on the threshold of World War III. The idea is that somehow Russia is never going to respond. Really? I mean, we're betting a lot on that when we think that we can send tanks, send longer range missiles, uh, get ready to give them aircraft, as has been uh, uh, requested, and, uh, and, and keep on fueling the war, you know, at the expense of the lives of hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians, and that somehow Russia's just going to sit there and take it? I mean, how naive must we be to believe that we can keep on fueling this war and there's not going to be a response? Now, I represented a substantial Ukrainian uh, constituency as a member of the United States Congress. And I've been to Ukraine several times, as well as Russia. And we have set, the United States has helped to set cousin against cousin. The Ukrainian people have been used as pawns in an international chess game that the United States has been playing. And look, I, I don't know of anybody who would want to justify uh, Russia's invasion. However, we must keep in mind, you go back to uh, 2012, 2014, where US policy wanted to continue to put pressure on Russia and encircle Russia, set up military, set up a, a military uh, uh, material, arms, missiles, so that we keep Russia in check and then at some point move in and knock out their government and put, put in one that's going to be more amenable to us. What? I mean, the way I look at it, regime change begins at home. Uh, you know, speaking of regime change, you often uh, share a stage with Tulsi Gabbard, and though she has been very vocal against regime change wars, she's also stated publicly, publicly several times that she does view Islamist terrorism as a major threat to the country and to the world, and she does support targeted drone warfare in an instance like that. Um, and I'm just curious from, you know, from your perspective, since you two are often very linked together. And I actually want to, I do want to move on in this conversation at some point to talk about the, the, the wanting to kind of bring all these third parties together and going into ranked choice voting and the, the efforts that you guys are, are doing with that, which I think is really great. Um, but is there some, is there a time in your mind when warfare is necessary or are you blanket anti-war? We're in the 21st century, at least last I checked. Every nation has a right of self-defense. America has a right of self-defense. Russia has a right of self-defense. China has a right of self-defense. Ukraine has a right of self-defense. Every nation has a right to self-defense. War should not be inevitable. Currently, we have an administration that does not believe in diplomacy and has actually subverted any efforts at, at reaching a negotiated settlement in Ukraine, to the detriment of the Ukrainian people, I might add. Um, no, I'm not for war. I think war is a racket. I, I think war is uh, the antithesis of what we're on this planet for. And if we have evolved as a species, the higher cortical functions should inform us that there's ways of settling our differences without killing each other. You know, to talk about neurophysiology here, we know that the lower limbic system, uh, fear, flight, fright, all those things get excited in this country lately. That, that's not, if our destiny is there, then, you know, we're going to be devolving, <laughs> moving back towards uh, a, a earlier uh, definition of, of the species. But that's not who we are as people. We're evolving, uh, hopefully, upward, and uh, war doesn't, doesn't match that. It, it, and, and in addition to that, you know, I can, I can make the philosophical argument against war. 
But the economic argument is there too. War ruins an economy. It's capital intensive. And what you do is you, you just waste a lot of money. But somebody's making money. You look at the profit sheets of all the major arms manufacturers, they're making money. I mean, war's a racket. You know, I'm not the first one to say that. Uh, you know, Smedley Butler, a you know, famous uh, soldier, once made that very clear. War is a racket. And we're, we're locked in it. And, and it's, it's part of what Barbara Tuckman calls a march of folly, where, where you know, nations can be convinced for a time, go into war, wave the flag, beat the chest, come up with uh, themes of national glory. It's all a lie. We, we have to find ways in this day and age of settling our differences without killing each other. And the, this, the lack of, of talent in diplomacy is concerning. And it can become catastrophic for our nation, as we have seen, uh, if you reflect upon uh, the, the deep meaning of the, re of the recent reporting of Seymour Hirsch talking about the pipeline. If, if few people can just take us to the brink of war without checking with anybody, where are we? Why do they love war so much? Why? We, we need to ask that question. And it's not being asked. There are people who feel that, you know, war's just great, really. War gives life more meaning, really. Who's life? Um, so I want to talk about this new, well, I, I don't think, I, I don't actually know if it's new, but it's certainly something that you and Tulsi Gabbard are headlining, which is the Independent National Convention this spring in Austin, Texas. So there's a convention happening April 3rd through 5th. And I think the last time, if I'm not mistaken, before the pandemic, this was in Wyoming, um, and what you guys are pushing for is something very interesting. It would be sort of the ending of the two-party system in a way, kind of creating unity amongst libertarians, green, independents, you know, all of these sort of the, the, the parties and the people that have not been able to, which is really the majority at this point. We're, we're now seeing that the, the Republican Party itself and the Democratic Party, the actual support for those parties has shrunk well below where independents are in this country at this point. So there's this idea that maybe independents could come together and sort of unify around, uh, you know, changing the system to where it's no longer a two-party system. Um, I'm curious if you could tell us a little bit more about this. Like, what do you think we really could dismantle the two-party system the way it is? I mean, there seems to be some forces working against that, namely the Electoral College, actually, when it comes to the presidential election, Winner take all sort of um, uh, you know races throughout the country. Is this possible? Well, let me give you a little preview of what I'm going to say uh, at 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 the event in April. Uh, first of all, I'm a Democrat. I have uh, taken an independent approach as a Democrat in challenging my party daily <laughs> for 16 years while in the Congress, and before that, and and since then. So, you know, and, and I think there are Democrats who, who are independent minded. Um, one of the problems of the primary system and the current political system is that it intensifies the hold that the two party system has on our politics. Um, you have to be a member of a party to run in a primary, right? You, um, uh, parties have rigged it state by state to make it very hard for independents to be able to qualify for a ballot. In some cases, you need hundreds of thousands of signatures. And I mean, it's, the system is set up to protect, to protect the two, two parties. Now, what I, what I will advocate and, and do advocate is independents voting in party primaries to try to get a, a different person in than the one who's currently holding the power. And to use the vote, to, you get two votes. You can, you can vote in a primary, you can vote in a general. Okay, somebody say, well, you've declared that you're a Democrat or Republican, you vote in a primary. Well, let me tell you, uh, I may be a Democrat, but I'm an independent Democrat. 
And I think that it's so important for independents to vote in primaries. Actually, you know, my wife, uh, Elizabeth, and I have been talking about this for years. Uh, she calls the approach uh, party animal, <laughs> that we should all be party animals for the primary. Vote in those primaries to try to affect the outcome. But then if it doesn't go our way, reserve the right to support an independent candidate. I mean, you know, we actually, we need to change the equation. And in doing so, we make both of the parties more accountable. And because if they're worried about a wave of so-called independent voters coming into primaries, they got to start looking to a broader constituency. Right now, they don't have to do that. You know, they figure you get the nomination of one party or another, you're home free. Well, maybe not. And so my approach would be a little bit different. Uh, take a party animal approach. Get people to vote in primaries, even though they're independents. And again, I'm a Democrat. I'm an independent Democrat. You know, I reserve the right to vote for whoever I want to in a general election. Uh, the party has to, it's up to the party to make the sale of why you should vote for their candidate, this Democrat or Republican candidate. But if they can't make that, if they can't deliver that, who says we're, we're locked in? Are you kidding? Really? And, you know, the Democrats have a, a, a real quandary here. You know, the idea that somehow 2022 reflected an, an impermeability to uh, a, a shift in 2024. Don't kid yourself, uh, my Democratic brothers and sisters. Uh, and, and I think that if, uh, if 2024 is going to show us anything, well, President Biden has... Uh, has been able to make a case on domestic policy, and you know, some would argue some aspects of it, but he's he's made a case. Foreign policy, they are a disaster, and they're they're in real trouble on that. If anybody wants to wants to take that challenge to them, in a primary or in a general election. Yeah, so this independent national convention, this sort of idea to unify the platform of independents, green, libertarians, undeclared voters, um, you know, it's, it's very interesting. The idea, from what I understand from the reporting, is that the, this independent convention supports ranked choice voting, bringing back blockchain-backed voter identification, um, and, you know, so, so these are very interesting ideas, but they're, they're ideas that are already out there. I don't know if you know the answer to this, because I know you're speaking at this event. You're headlining along with Tulsi Gabbard, but I don't know how involved you are with the independent national uh, committee or, you know, the, the people that are behind all of this. But there are other parties that have come out looking to do something similar, namely the forward party that is put out there by Andrew Yang. Is he at all involved in this? Because he's also advocating for ranked choice voting. There's also the I, unity I, ticket. I, I, I can't speak for him, but I will tell you this, that it, it's important for groups to come together to try to exercise some kind of collective power. But I see that as kind of the second step. The first step being don't ignore the primary elections. Do not ignore the primary elections. Now, I know some people, oh, I don't want to vote in a party primary. I don't want to declare I'm a Democrat or Republican. Uh, let me tell you something. One can still be very independent minded and enter into a party primary and reserve the right to vote differently in a general election. This idea that somehow we're all locked in once we do, you know, go one way or another, that's not true. And so I, I that's going to be my message. And uh, I, I think it's good for people to call. I think it's great for people to coalesce, but put the pressure on the primary so that the respective candidates aren't given a free pass. Because what happens if primary voters have an outsized influence on the process, and those who stay out of voting in a primary are doing so to their detriment, and you know one must we have to create some new space here. I can be independent and a Democrat. I can be independent and a Republican. Uh, we have to expand our our identification of who we are politically you know there's been an expansion of personal identification over the last uh, two decades about who individuals are as people well our, our political definition is very narrow right now we need to expand who we are as uh, political 
uh, entities, as political individuals, and not pigeonhole ourselves and say, well, we can only, you know, we, we have to stay out of this process because it's tainted. Yeah, right, uh, of course it is. Uh, but without us, it, it just becomes worse. I, I just, I don't understand why you're still a Democrat, Dennis. I'm going to be honest with you. Um, I mean, the party has moved away from you. more. In some ways, I suppose some of the the narratives has have moved towards some of the things that you've been championing for a while, such as, you know, you've been a long supporter of free education and universal health care. That is something the Democratic Party at times says they're for, but then in practice, they don't ultimately implement those ideas. Whenever they get the chance, they seem to sabotage them behind the scenes. Um, and then further, you know, you've been demonized by the Democratic Party over and over for the time that you were against the Iraq war, for the time you sat down with Bashar al-Assad. Um, you you are continually against the 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 never ending wars that we're in now, which is not any not anywhere in the Democratic Party platform at all. Um, being against the surveillance state when Democrats seem to be for the surveillance state, um, you know, besides infrastructure. I mean, I guess <laughs> besides wanting to make huge investments in infrastructure, which Joe Biden says he wants to do. I mean, why are you still a Democrat? Why do you even they're moving away from you? So why are you still insisting on being a Democrat? Why not just say that's it? I'm out. I'm an independent. I'm gone. Check, please. <laughs> uh, let, let me just, uh, uh, you know, I'm a Christian, OK, so I'm doing missionary work. Uh, the Democratic Party uh, uh, needs reform. And, I, and I've been a spokesperson for that for many years and, you know, will continue to be. Is it is it tempting to say I'm out of here? <laughs> Yeah. If you go from Democrat to Republican or Republican to Democrat, you're still inside the system, right? I mean, we're all in a system here. And so uh, I, I choose to stand uh, within a party, but apart from the parties at the same time, because I'm independent minded. And this is the, and this is the appeal that I make to people. Think for yourself. Vote in primaries. But Dennis, the Democratic Party doesn't like you. You know, I mean, oh. same with like, like Tulsi Gabbard. I told Tulsi a long time ago, I said to her, why are you even with the Democratic Party? You should honestly just, you know, get, it, it, they don't like you. So why stick around hanging out with and trying? It's like school kids trying to sit down at lunch with the group of people that are sneering at them and not wanting them to sit down. So why? I mean, they don't like you. And you don't share positions with them. They smear you, even when you're right, which you've been most of the time. And they don't like that. They don't appreciate it. So I just don't understand. I mean, is it just is it is it just too difficult to give up? I know a lot of people right now, they don't want to give it up because they just feel like, well, I've always been a Democrat. But I just can't, you know, it's like I can't quit them. I mean, you got to break up. Yeah, I think you have to break up, Dennis. You know, uh, you know, of course, this is a question I think many people to grips with. Um, I, I, I still believe in the historic mission of the Democratic Party that uh, was laid out in many ways by the administration of Franklin Roosevelt. Um, you know, I, behind me, I've got a, a library that is made up of uh, people that I've admired over the years, like Hubert Humphrey, uh, Robert Kennedy, uh, John F. Kennedy. Um, and, you know, there, there are people who are really dedicated to the larger vision of, of what America can be. Now, you know, one of the things we deal with is where are the differences between the two parties? Do you have to be one in one or the other? Um, you know, no. <laughs> but I, I, my approach is a little bit different, though. I say that I don't care whether people inside the party like me or not. That's not my problem. What, what anybody in the party thinks of me is none of my business. But I choose to stay inside the party as a way of trying to make the influence inside the party, however long it might take, and at the same time, uh, find a way to give people an opportunity to take a, a new direction. Yeah, I, 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 I don't... 
I'm very careful about trying to separate myself from uh, uh, from the system itself because we, we this is where we're this is where we are. Uh, I, I can oppose it from within, and I do. Dennis, you know what I would like to see? Because um, I agree with you on most of your political positions, if not all of them, actually. Um, I, I would like to see you run as an independent. I'd like to see you back in the political game, but I'd like to see you running as an independent. With, I just don't think that you're going to get the support coming from Democrats. I don't think it's there. And I, I think that if you ran as an independent, we might actually get you back into a position where we need you, where you would well, then you be know, able to. I, 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 you know, I'm, I appreciate you saying that. And I, uh, I'm not tone deaf. <laughs> I hear you. Uh, but to, it's never been about me. You know, it's, it, and although I, you know, I have a lifetime of service, there's some bigger issues that I'm looking at. And and if if we can create an opening inside the Democratic Party once again for peace, who knows? I mean, that could matter in terms of the entire world right now. So I'm holding that space, which I know exists. I know there's congressional Democrats who agree with me, but they don't want to take on the leadership. They don't want to take on the White House. I understand that. I understand the pressures. So, you know. I, I, I try to reach out to Democrats, Republicans, and independents simultaneously because we're one country. You know, when I was in Congress, I'd, I'd walk into the chamber and I'd look at the, uh, the canopy of the House. It's the, the, the roof of the House of Representatives, if you want to call it that. And there is this enormous eagle spreading its wings across the chamber. It's etched in glass. It's really beautiful. And it reminds me that eagle needs at least two wings to fly, right? But it also has a body, and the body could be called the independence. So you have a left wing and a right wing, and, you know, it can move forward. So I, I try to reach out to beyond party. And, and so in that way, I'm independent-minded. I reach the Republicans. I reach the Democrats. I don't have any problem with that at all. I don't feel constrained that I have to identify myself with a party, but I'm in a party to see if there's any way to change the direction of it. And, you know, I'll continue to try until I feel that it's a hopeless case. But, you know, I haven't, I haven't felt that. Although, keep in mind that when I was elected mayor of Cleveland, I was elected as an independent. When I was um, elected, and I, I defeated both political parties, I did run for Congress as an independent in 1974. And I came, I came pretty close. It was, Three candidates bunched in the in the thirty percentiles. So you know I'm uh, again <laughs> I'm independent minded. Uh, happen to be in a particular uh, uh, pew, but the the larger uh, collectivity here is what it means to be an American. And I think we need to go through this period of redefining that because it goes way beyond political parties. It goes way beyond left and right. It goes to something that connects our head, you know, our head and our heart. And it, it, it raises questions about who we are as human beings. I mean, that's what it ultimately gets through. You know, our, do we have anything in common with each other? Do we have any, as Americans, do we have anything in common with people in different countries? And I think the answer to that is yes. When I ran for president, I found that there is an underlying unity in this country, which partisan politics uh, seeks to sever for, for advantage. Um, it, 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 you know, we we are there's there's so much that we have in common with each other, and so I political parties don't always address that, uh, and and we have in, much in common with people worldwide, so we have to stop this continual attempt to uh, try to make uh, other groups uh, uh, outcasts, to try to depict people as being less than to try to make the, make of them, evoke an enemy of them. And we have to stop that. Because that's, that's the base of war. You know, we have to create an enemy and then pour our, our nation's treasure into this abyss of, uh, of a war. We have to stop that. It's, it's really, we need to be beyond that. That's not, who, that's not who we should be as human beings. I mean, it's really, it, it, it's really revolting 
uh, to have to see people who truly and sincerely uh, believe that war is the only way. I mean, that might be for them, but don't drag us, the rest of us, in with in 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 with you into a grave. Well, Dennis, I want to leave it there. Uh, this has been an excellent conversation. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and to, uh, talking with us about this. And I think I'll see you uh, pretty soon, right, at the anti-war rally, the Rage Against the War machine in Washington, D.C., February 19th. I think we're both speakers at that event yes. at Lincoln Memorial, marching yes. our way to, to the White House. I'll be there uh, with you. And I just want to thank you for being so present in this in this uh, interview. I mean, you, you're, uh, uh, you're challenging and also on point, and I, I'm grateful for that. Thanks so much for this chance to speak with you. I, I look forward in, uh, to seeing you in, uh, in, in D.C. and perhaps in Austin as well. Thank you. Dennis Kucinich, thank you so much.